policy learning from Red Plus for forest restoration and zero deforestation initiatives and also other forest related initiatives. Um, welcome to this rather cozy setting and room. I think we should leave the door probably open to ensure we um, have some oxygen for the next hour and a half. Um, welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming. And also welcome to the panelists, whom I will introduce in a second. Just to um, introduce myself, my name is Tim Christofferson. I work for UN Environment. I coordinate our activities on forests and climate change. That includes the UN Red Program. And I'm pleased to be moderating this event today, which hopes to enable you, the audience, to draw the connection or connect the dots between all these different forest-related <coughs> activities. So anybody who knows all of the following acronyms will uh, receive a prize. <laughs> Red Plus, NAPAS, NAMAS, NDCs, NBSUBS, FLEC T, TFA 2020, NYDF, Bond Challenge, and SDG 15. <laughs> I'm not going to explain any of those, but just to assure you, they all are central to forests, and forests are central to these initiatives. But there are quite a lot of those, and it can be quite confusing, the jungle of forest initiatives, to make sense of all that. And this event is about the compass, the compass that we need to navigate those forest initiatives and learn from the successes we've had in some of them, particularly in Red Plus, which is in many ways in one of the older ones and the bigger, one of the bigger ones of those forest-related initiatives and how we can translate those lessons into other policy areas and also into other sectors that impact on forests. We are looking forward to hearing from our panel, but we also look forward to hearing from all of you. At the end of brief introductions from the panel, we'll have a round of questions and answers. And I hope that collectively, we can come up with the answer of how all these forest-related initiatives come together towards the sustainable development goals. And that prompts me to introduce our first speaker. I will introduce the speakers as we go uh, through the different interventions from our panelists. But our first speaker is Peter Holmgren, Director General of the Center for International Forestry Research. And our host here, if you will, as C4 is the main organizer of Global Landscapes Forum. Peter, we're very happy to have you with us. You know uh, the world of Red Plus and the different forest initiatives like few others. And we hope uh, you will give us the C4 team. I'd like to wish you all very welcome to this uh, year's edition of the Global Landscapes Forum, GLF. That was actually an acronym you missed. <laughs> um, what I would like to do is a very brief introduction. I don't think I will make all those connections. That was what I would keep to learn, actually, so uh, to get an update on this. Um, first to say that in a previous life, when I worked for FAO, um, I was part of the team that founded the UN Red Program together with colleagues from then UNEP, now UNED, and uh, also UNDP. And that was eight years ago. And, um, a lot of things have, of course, happened over those eight years, and I think the evolution of things is something we're going to hear about today. Um, in, my, in my previous role, um, one, one of uh, C4's uh, roles have been through the years, and since before um, I came on board on, on C4, to do a global comparative study on uh, red plus initiatives and implementation in a number of countries. Um, and this has, of course, hopefully, helped to bring some experiences and some knowledge to the tables and uh, bring some uh, of that evolution to happen. And we be interested to hear from others in the room just how, how that has been uh, moving. Um, I'd like to mention that Christopher Marcius on the front row is currently leading the climate change research at C4. So for any more detailed questions, please check with, with Chris. Um, I'd also like to then briefly connect to the Sustainable Development Goals as I mentioned, because part of the evolution as I see it is that 
spread, as well as the, the, the climate agenda overall, has a great opportunity in uh, connecting with the broader development agenda. I think this is a discussion we've had since the inception of RED, and I've probably been towards the end of the spectrum where I wanted to, to integrate the, the RED actions uh, in turned around. Instead of talking about RED with co-benefits, perhaps we should talk about sustainable development with climate as the co-benefit. And I think that, that will probably enrich the discussion if we take that perspective. Um, it doesn't really change the objectives, it doesn't change the ambition with RED, but it that might change how we organize the implementation of it. And that also connects to my final point, which is that I'm really happy that we're having the discussions about RED and forest related initiatives within the Landscapes Forum, because the connections between forestry, forest conser conservation, agriculture, other land uses, the livelihoods of billions of people in the world's landscapes is really crucial and a very, very big part of the solutions we need. So I'm, I'm grateful for this session. Um, look forward to hearing more from the other panelists and from everybody else in the room. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and hope that that was a sufficient introduction to the topic. Back to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Peter, and indeed, um, thanks for setting the scene. We'll come back to both, um, or I think all of those points that you mentioned, including um, seeing our action on forest and red plus as, uh, or seeing carbon as the co-benefit rather than as the main and one and only benefit. I think that's a view that is now more and more persistent in many of those countries. And one of those countries that has had that view for a long time and early on and is a, has been a champion of the forest agenda long before Red Plus um, is Costa Rica, of course. We all, uh, I think, have um, benefited from the experience and we're very pleased to have Minister Gutierrez here, Edgar Gutierrez Espelata, is the Minister of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. He's also the President of the UN Environment Assembly. Uh, for the time and we're very happy to have you here minister and please if you could share with us the lessons from Costa Rica on how to stay the strategic course on forests. Thank you very much. Is this necessary? For the translation. For the translation, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, yeah. hello everybody, good morning. Yes, indeed, uh, uh, Costa Rica um, as you said, uh, has been very much uh, into the, the way of thinking that sustainable development of course is part of our own history since 19, 1949, where um, most of our social and environmental policies started to, to be in place. And of course, uh, we have been learning in the process. It has been that easy. We have had to, to test different ways of doing things, and sometimes we fail, but um, that's, that's the way of uh, creating knowledge, and uh, that's the way of uh, creating a public policy that really uh, goes along with the, with the main objectives, objectives of, of, uh, that have been set up by the people. In our case, um, in our case, the strategic framework has been placed on two main things. One is the National Development Plan. The different National Development Plans, now we have a, de a National Development Plan that goes from 2015 to 2018. And therefore, the other part of that is the National Forest Development Plan that goes uh, uh, from 2011 to 2010. But the main thing of basically most of the national plans and the national forest development plan is that it, it always keeps on saying that we have to maintain and increase the sustain, the sustain in, a, in a sustained manner the forest cover by evaluation of forest and forest ecosystems and lands and, lands and their services Ensure, ensuring legal certainty, land tenure, and the right of owners to use private property and to ensure essential goods and services 
for the quality of life of people. These are the five main aspects that have been embraced, embraced by all the, the, the policies that we have, we have been able to, to, to put in place. And, and for that, I have to tell you, I have to tell you that the key political and economic factors that promoted the recovery of forest recovery in Costa Rica are this one that you have in the screen. The financial mechanism, very important. We had experience with different types of financial mechanisms. One, we put it in place in 1979 to 1986. And it was a sort of, of um, deduction from the, from the rent tax that we provided to, to producers in political activities. The second one goes from 1981 to 1995, and it was called the Forest Bond Certificate. It was another incentive. And the third one, from 1991 to 2017, still on, is the payment for environmental services. The other important aspect on these uh, factors is the enabling legal framework. And for that, we have had three forestry laws in the last 15 years, and every time we try to improve this, uh, this uh, act. And in the last one, uh, in, the, in, the, in the actual law that we have, the forestry law, is where we introduce a very important and crucial aspect that we prohibited the change of land use. Since 1995 in Costa Rica, the change, the change of, uh, what is this? Yeah. The change of land use is, is prohibited by law. And that has helped us then to recover forests because once, for example, a pasture land is abandoned and second growth start coming up, that is not a, 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 the owner is not, not going to be able to cut the second growth in order for, 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 for getting back the pasture land, but he has to maintain that. But then, because of that, then we had to provide means for the landowner to keep the forest. And that's why we say we are going to pay you for the environmental services provided. This is the, the PS, PSE uh, scheme. And the third, the third uh, component in these political and economic factors are the agroenvironmental development strategies. And um, for that, this is a, that, that is something that has been in place in a way, you know, in a way uh, uh, through a, at the beginning in a silo sort of con uh, conception. Is that working this? Hello? Now, this one? I was saying that that um, that the agroenvironmental development strategies that we have taken at the beginning were were viewed as a silos. You know, the agricultural sector working in one part, the forestry sector working in the other part. And, but, but it has been part of the of the history of, of our rural development in Costa Rica, and we had agroforestry. Um, developments since 2001, 2010, and then 2011, 2020 with the new National Forestry Plan. The other component, a very important, important as well, is the, the protected areas. In 1970, 70, we established the first protected area in Costa Rica. And since then, we have been working in that line. And now, nowadays, we have 23% of our, our, of our territory uh, um, protected and, and about 
23% of the land in Costa Rica has to do, even private in private land, has to do with what we call biological corridors. And the other component is the academic training, very important one. Before 1990s, uh, most of the forestry work was done by agronomists. We didn't have foresters in Costa Rica. Uh, and since 19, middle of the 90s, we started graduating in public universities forest, foresters that has helped a lot uh, in the process of the recuperation of the forest land. And the other component is the institutional capa a, a <coughs> capacity. In 1986, Costa Rica created the Ministry of Natural Resources, Energy, and Mines, before Rio, 92. Later on, this ministry was turned into the Ministry of Environment and Energy, what is today. And since then, it has, it has, it has been um, leading with the, with the, with the all related activities with forestry and envir environment as a, as a, as a whole. Uh, all these are viewed in, um, in, this, in this graph that you have in the screen. Huh? Huh? Well, you, you are not able to read, to, to read that, of course. But the important thing is that this portion here shows the, the, amount, the amount of, um, of um, investments that were provided by the different economic instruments that were put in place. These are, here it's very interesting, this is, these are incentives, then drops to 95, because we have a new law, and from the new law on, we have been working with the payment of environmental services, and by now, we already reached about the same amount of money invested in, in forestry activities. And here it shows how everything is that from the policy perspective, every time that, that uh, a decision was taken, you know, this reflected, of course, in, in, the, way, in the way of, uh, of the impact in the land cover. Um, what's the next one? That is uh, Costa Rica in, in, that is Costa Rica in 19, let me see, 1960, we had 53%, no, that, uh, no, I'm sorry, that one. That is Costa Rica, the first one, 19, 1960, 53% of cover, forest cover, and in 1987, 26% of forest cover. You see here, <coughs> all these sections, and this part of here, basically, most of our deforestation was due to the expansion of the agricultural frontier, and, and, and mainly a big percentage of that because of uh, the, the expansion of the, of the forest code, uh, the pasture, pasture uh, here. And this is, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. It is, it is on? Yeah, no. And this is, this is now that we have been able to recover um, to 52% of the territory. So we're coming from 27% to 52% in nowadays, and that's the, that, that, that is how it shows, it's being shown in, in the screen. Of course, all this has to do with, with the impact in climate change. Uh, here we are coming from a big high rate of deforestation, so we have a lot of emissions. We started rec recuperating, and by now we are about in this uh, in this stage here, where we have we have been able to actually reduce quite a bit the the uh, the, the the of course because of the deforestation we have been able to reduce the emissions from the forestry sector. And we are still working on that. I mean, this is part of uh, our main uh, main challenges. And talking about challenges, 
we decided to put ourselves a, a big challenge, and it was to rehabilitate one million hectares of degraded or overused land by 2030. That's a big challenge. You know, when, when you come from from 26 percent, 27 percent of forest cover up, every, everything you do is going to be added. It's going to be added very easily. But once you you're, you are reaching, you know the the potential. It's very difficult to add just one percent. So we still that we we decided to to put this this challenge uh, before us, and and we're working towards that. And the consolidation of the efforts to improve the sustainability of agriculture and forestry sectors goes to the livestock NAMA, the, the mitigation program with livestock, we already have it in place. We're working with that thanks to um, uh, the support of UK and Germany. It's very, very interesting how uh, the livestock people is very much interested in reducing mitigation by improving the way of, of doing business in their own farms. The coffee NAMA, we're working with coffee growers uh, to reduce emissions as well. Uh, by implementing different sort of strategies in the plantation and different sort of strategies in benefiting the, the coffee. The red plus strategy, of course, is in place. Uh, a lot of expectations around it. And low carbon cattle development strategies is a very <coughs> important thing that we are working with the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock uh, mm -hmm. towards reducing emissions from, from um, from uh, droppings, cattle droppings, and that sort of things, you know, by improving the diet of the of the cattle, the reforestation program. But basically, what what I wanted to come is the last one: productive and inclusive rural landscapes. We 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 have thought that this is this is the key. Since 1995, we have been working in rehabilitating the greater lands, and I say we because I started the program. Uh, as part of, of the implementation of the, of the Convention on the, the Certification and Fight of the Great Lands in Costa Rica. And we've had already quite a bit of experience in, in rehabilitating the Great Lands in different watershed, watersheds. And learning from that, we have decided, the, minis the Minister of Agriculture and myself, that we have to put in place a very strong national program in Costa Rica that has to do with productive and inclusive rural landscape. That's the way of going, uh, according to our beliefs, in, in Costa Rica for the for the years to come. And of course, <coughs> to do that, we need the engagement of different sectors. It's not just a public thing. It has to do with the, the engagement of cooperatives engagement of private owners, the engagement of private uh, 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 enterprises, etc. I mean, it, this is a very important and, and crucial thing. And this is the way within, within that we could disaggregate this, grand, this great national effort in recuperating one million hectares. We had pasture lands, we have to work with pasture lands, improving, improving it by, by, by planting more trees, in them and, and enrich the, enrich, enriching them uh, with a different sort of uh, <coughs> vegetation cover, uh, permanent crops, secondary growth forests, private old growth mm -hmm. forests, managing in, in a better way. So at the end of the day, by 2030, we hope to have recovered one million hectares of degraded, degraded, degraded lands. And the, 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 the good part of this story is that this strategy is not being developed just by the Ministry of Environment. It's being developed by the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Agriculture. We are working together on this. <coughs> this is a, a map that we did uh, on the rehabilitation opportunities that we have. We already have it uh, very well mapped and, and, and the strategy goes along. And the other thing is that the co-benefits of all this effort, ecotourism. You know, some, someone could ask why why we Costa Rica Costa Ricans are getting quite a bit of uh, tourists that comes to our country and that goes to Nicaragua or Salvador or, 
pas a bar not not such but Honduras, you know, or Panama. I mean most of us we have some sort of same forest, you know, some sort of biodiversity. Why they come to Costa Rica? Or why you come to Costa Rica? Or you would come to Costa Rica. Well, you know the, the difference. Um, I'm I, here. I I'm very strongly on this. Uh, the difference is that people that comes to Costa Rica comes to a place where we, the locals, know our nature, and we can explain that to the to, to the to the visitors. And that is why tourists in Costa Rica spend more than ten days in the country instead of the world average of five days visiting one place. They stay more than 10 days in our country. Travels a lot because they want to know everything. And they are able to actually learn because people actually explain that. That's <coughs> something that we have learned and that is something that we have shared with communities. Most of our um, uh, infrastructure for 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 visitors are in the communities, are the small hotels, you know, rural hotels and that sort of thing. You know, we we do have you know these chain hotels and this, that sort of things, but they have charters that come. You know, but uh, but uh, this is a very important co benefit that we are actually learning from. And the other one is water, of course. Water is a very important thing. About seventy percent of our our uh, energy production comes from water, and fifty percent comes from geothermal. Those are in uh, in uh, nearby volcanoes, but these are part of the recuperation of the land as well. So we have a levy on water, and what we, what this levy is producing is goes back to our forestry programs. So with this, what I want to, to show you is that. That, um, that a national effort once has a very, very well-devised horizon with very clear objectives of sustainable development, as Peter was saying, with very clear objectives that the benefit of you know, all this, at the end of the day, has to be the people, the ones that benefit the most. But then we have to think broadly, and we have to think not in silos, but thinking in, in, in the, from the, the strategic perspective by developing the land as it has to be in the way of being the landscape, but the museum of that landscape and not just one particular issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Gutierrez, for those inspiring words. Um, I think now all we have to do is replicate that in about 60 countries and then we'll be all set. Um, but um, I think um, we are starting to do in fact exactly that, trying to learn from each other and replicate um, lessons learned in other countries. So let me just switch to the microphone here. Thank you. We are doing exactly that, trying to learn from the countries that have found the success formula, how you create productive, resilient landscapes for people, food, and nature. And Costa Rica certainly is one example where that has worked. We have um, the UN Red program has done a South-South learning experience between Costa Rica and Cote d'Ivoire, where I think the situation is now very similar to what it was in Costa Rica about 30 years ago. And Cote d'Ivoire will look, hopefully, like Costa Rica in 20 years or less from now, because... Two days ago we signed an agreement, a cooperation agreement. Exactly. So, very good. Um, and we're happy to have those two countries next to each other to showcase also how we can learn from each other. Because one thing we believe was done right in the very beginning in Red Plus was to put the countries firmly in the driver's seat. The countries have to be the ones who coordinate all these international NGOs and IGOs and all these people coming in with good ideas. The countries have to be the ones who develop their national vision and who ensure policy coherence. I think policy coherence, the public-private partnership, all these ingredients of success the minister mentioned 
are very important and we're looking forward to now hearing from Marcel Yao. Marcel Yao is the coordinator of Côte d'Ivoire's National Climate Change Program and the permanent <laughs> executive secretary of the Red Plus with very clear strategies, guidance set by the government and determination and persistence. One also has to recognize that these things take time. If we want to restore our forest, turn the deforestation curve and the forest degradation curve around, which is a huge challenge in many countries. It takes time, persistence, and policy coherence. It also takes some money. And I think this is one issue you mentioned, the payment for existing services and the amounts raised. And I think it's also important to note that, um, as far as I'm informed, all or almost all of that funding came from Costa Rica's domestic resources. This was not an internationally funded program. It was Costa Rica's domestic resources from a fuel tax and other, um, other sources that funded this remarkable turnaround. I think this is also important to note in the context of being here at the climate conventions where we talk a lot about the $10 billion that are now in the Green Climate Fund, but that is actually very little money compared to a $75 trillion world economy. And we have to be very smart in investing that public money that is limited to really change the way things are done at the national level. So by now, I hope everybody has a headset and we can launch into Marcel's presentation, please. Thank you, team. Je voulais commencer d'abord par remercier hein, pour l'opportunité que vous donnez à la Côte d'Ivoire de présenter sa stratégie nationale Red Plus. Je suppose que tout le monde connaît la Côte d'Ivoire. Pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas encore la Côte d'Ivoire, sachez que c'est un pays de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Et à chaque fois que vous voulez une tasse de chocolat ou un morceau de chocolat, sachez que c'est le premier pays producteur au monde de cacao. Environ 40% de la production mondiale. Mais malheureusement, cette production de cacao s'est faite au détriment de la préservation des forêts. Malheureusement. Donc nous allons vous présenter un peu les enjeux et le contexte de la Red Plus en Côte d'Ivoire. Vous voyez donc, nous sommes champions au niveau de la production de cacao, champions également d'Afrique de football, avec Didier Dorba, et champions aussi de la déforestation. Donc sur ces trois cadres, vous voyez un peu l'évolution de la déforestation. Et je rappelle que le, la production de cacao dans les années 90 se faisait essentiellement au centre du pays. Et après cette production s'est déplacée à l'est du pays. Et actuellement, 60% de la production nationale provient du sud-ouest de la Côte d'Ivoire, juste autour du dernier parc qui a été encore très bien conservé. Voilà. Donc c'est un pays à fort potentiel agricole, avec environ 40 spéculations agricoles. Malheureusement, cette agriculture se fait donc au détriment des forêts. Et donc, depuis 2011, le nouveau gouvernement a décidé d'inverser donc cette tendance-là pour concilier l'agriculture avec la préservation des forêts. Le pays a donc décidé de faire de l'arrêt plus une question politique et de développement national. Et un dialogue interministériel a été engagé depuis 2012 
qui aboutit à une politique d'agriculture zéro déforestation. Au niveau des facteurs de la déforestation, bien évidemment, nous avons l'agriculture, la production de charbon de bois, l'exploitation minière, et l'extension des infrastructures. Avec notre nouvelle stratégie, et plus, chaque facteur donc, de la déforestation est adressé par un axe stratégique. Également au niveau des facteurs indirects de la déforestation, nous avons adressé également des axes stratégiques. Juste rappeler que ce lundi, nous avons donc signé un mémorandum avec le Costa Rica. Une mission, grâce à l'appui de l'ONU Red, est, est partie au Costa Rica pour aller voir un peu ce qui se passe là-bas. Nous avons vraiment été émerveillés. Et cette nouvelle politique d'agriculture zéro déforestation, donc, va se faire autour d'une planification nationale, d'un système PSE une stratégie énergétique durable, d'un aménagement du territoire et de sécurisation foncière, une protection des aires protégées. Beaucoup de dialogues ont été entrepris au niveau national hein, avec la signature de convention avec les différentes filières agricoles, EBA, cacao, palmier à huile, et surtout l'implication du ministère du Plan et du Développement. Pour que la question de la préservation des forêts et du changement climatique soit bien intégrée dans la planification nationale. Et la REP plus fait donc partie intégrante de nos IMDC qui ont été présentés l'année dernière. Alors, au niveau des avancées de la République en Côte d'Ivoire, il faut dire qu'il y a un bon cadre de concertation permanent qui a été mis en place, ce qui n'était pas le cas. Auparavant, nous avons une politique agricole différent de la politique forestière, différent de la politique minière, etc. etc. Donc il y a eu beaucoup d'avancées, mais de nombreux défis restent encore à relever, dont l'intégration de la forêt dans la planification nationale, l'alignement de l'appui des partenaires à la stratégie nationale REP+, et la traduction de la volonté politique au niveau national en appui budgétaire. Voilà, je rappelle que le président de la République a annoncé en 2014 hein, l'objectif de tendre vers une agriculture zéro déforestation. Et hier, il était en visite sur le stand de la Côte d'Ivoire. Nous lui avons rappelé d'augmenter également des financements nationaux pour la préservation des forêts. Et là, c'est les résultats d'une excellente étude hein, que nous venons de finaliser avec l'appui de l'UNRED, de FI. Merci à Adeline et Daniela et Danaï qui nous accompagnent pour cette étude-là. Alors, donc, l'étude a montré hein, que les financements sont insuffisants et, et mal alignés au niveau de, de la REP+. Voilà. 
Mais pour rappeler, cette étude a été menée en coordination avec tous les ministères différents et tous les partis, les partis présentes nationales avec nos partenaires nationaux également. Au niveau des principaux résultats, vous notez en rouge hein, qu'en 2015, seulement 28 millions de dollars ont été investis dans la lutte contre la déforestation. Alors, cela est largement insuffisant. Et en 2015 également, ce sont 140 millions de dollars qui sont des financements essentiellement agricoles, mais mal alignés aux objectifs de, de la Red Plus. Et l'étude a montré que pour atteindre donc nos objectifs de 20% du territoire couvert de forêt en 2030, il nous faut environ 289 millions de dollars par an. Vous voyez que c'est beaucoup. Et c'est largement insuffisant à ce qui est fait actuellement pour l'arrêt plus de les changements climatiques. Et nous avons noté également que plusieurs secteurs qui sont plus ou moins liés à la préservation des forêts sont insuffisamment financés. L'intensification agricole, l'aménagement du territoire, la planification nationale, l'énergie domestique durable, etc. Donc il va falloir non seulement augmenter les financements en faveur de la forêt, mais également bien les orienter. Et nous avons une opportunité avec la Red Plus et avec cette étude de pouvoir revertir toute notre planification nationale pour tendre vers une économie verte et suivre vraiment l'exemple du Costa Rica. Alors j'aime bien ces escaliers-là. Euh, nous sommes à mi-parcours hein, et nous pensons que beaucoup de résultats ont été atteints. Mais pour que l'arrêt plus puisse continuer à monter ses marches, il va falloir donc renforcer les financements autour du secteur de la forêt et de ses secteurs annexes. Je rappelle que nous avons un contexte historique un peu similaire à celui du Costa Rica. Parce que nous avons traversé également une crise politique. Et nous avons eu deux présidents pendant deux ou trois mois également. Et nous espérons qu'avec cette mission et cette signature de MOU, avec donc l'appui des techniciens du Costa Rica, nous pourrons adapter les PSE adapter la loi de changement d'utilisation des terres en Côte d'Ivoire en vue d'atteindre nos, nos objectifs. Merci beaucoup pour votre énorme attention. Merci beaucoup Marcel, thank you very much. And um, the challenges that Costa Rica has overcome are really very similar to the ones that Cote d'Ivoire is facing now. So um, we're happy to support that South-South collaboration in, in any way we can also in the future. The private sector engagement is something that I think we will come back to um, both in our next uh, intervention but also um, later in the discussion. I. We saw the figures you presented, Marcel, but I heard yesterday that one of the big uh, chocolate companies, that I won't name here, but one of the biggest ones that deals in chocolate, they spend $40 million a year alone on certifying their cocoa supply chain. So uh, these sums of money that are invested and um, moved around in the private sector are often orders of magnitude larger than the public funds we have at our disposal. So forming the right public-private partnerships is of course also key and that um, is a good segue to our next speaker who is um, well known to many of us, Aida Greenberry, is the head of sustainability, in fact the managing director of sustainability and stakeholder engagement at Asia Pulp and Paper Group. And Aida has also been very active from the beginning in this um, first small but now quite large cluster of companies that have committed to 
zero deforestation supply chains and have made that commitment public, amongst others, in the New York Declaration on Forests. That was one of the acronyms I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and we're very happy to hear now from AIDA how the public policy progress and learning can also help the private sector in overcoming their challenges, which have to do with monitoring and stakeholder engagement, many other issues. AIDA, over to you, please. Thank you, Tim. Um, for some of you who don't know who we are, Asia Pulp and Paper Group, we are uh, possibly one of the largest integrated forestry and pulp and paper group in the world. We are basically splitting our operation in Indonesia and in, uh, in Jakarta and Shanghai. And um, turnover is about $20 billion a year. And uh, capacity of pulp and paper, pulp and, uh, uh, sorry, and paper and packaging is about 20 million tons a year as well. So we're not a conservation uh, group. We are basically um, a, a paper company. My story is very similar to the story from Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, we used to also um, uh, build our plantation uh, in our supply chain uh, through mostly deforestation as well. Um, and in the, our supply chain in Indonesia and China right now is basically amounting about um, 3 million hectares of forest, so 2.6 million hectares is being managed by our suppliers in our supply chain in Indonesia. And uh, there were so many uh, hundreds and thousands of hectares of forest has been converted to develop this um, uh, popwood plantation in the past. The, the journey started uh, in February 2013 when my company um, launched um, a zero deforestation policy. Of course, the aim is um, to stop deforestation in our supply chain. Um, Zero deforestation policy that we have is basically consisting of the protection of high conservation values, the, uh, protect, the identification and protection of high carbon stock, uh, implementation of free and prior consent, and also the resolutions of contract conflicts across the whole supply chain. So that has to be done in one package under zero deforestation policy. So uh, we thought that uh, halting deforestation back then was as simple as launching a policy and turning off uh, chainsaw and bulldozers and deforestation would stop, right? Um, wrong. Because uh, when we ask an uh, independent uh, auditor to have a look at how we're doing with our zero deforestation policy, we found that deforestation is still happening. Yes, the, de uh, the deforestation is not being done by our suppliers, but there are other actors who are continue, continuing with encroachment. So then, um, go back to what Peter, Peter mentioned in the beginning, you know, like how, how is this policy, Red Plus and everything, how is this evolved? How is zero deforestation evolved is quite interesting as well. Um, we found that the implementing the policy in just one, one or two concessions or in your supply chain is definitely not enough either to have a look at uh, um, other uh, aspects outside our landscape, outside our uh, concessions. So, um, um, right now we, we basically, um, I want to go back to Red Plus a, a little bit. With Red Plus, I mean the objective with our zero development policy and Red Plus is basically the same. But then, um, how we evolve in the implementing of zero deforestation and also supporting Red Plus is quite interesting because right now I believe, and I think a lot of people share with, with what I believe, is that Red Plus cannot stand alone. And, but it's good because there are so many different initiatives out there, such as the one uh, uh, um, um, proposed and also implemented by private sectors, who can complement uh, complement the implementation of Red Plus, which is the, the landscape approach, the uh, programs with the community and everything else. All these all these elements can complement Red Plus to make sure that Red Plus will succeed um, sooner than later. Um, <coughs> Go back to the public-private partnership. It's also quite interesting. Um, my role as 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 a representative of the private sectors in in in, in zero deforestation is definitely we we would like to play more important role in uh, driving um, you know zero deforestation moving forward. And um, one thing that we can do in 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 making 
Red was more successful in halting deforest uh, deforestation in the landscape, especially leveraging our role in, in, in um, providing resources. The resources can be human resources, because we have human resources, trained human resources on the ground, of course our supply chain, or financial uh, resources. The financial resources, for example, like, uh, like Tim said before, that, that the um, uh, private sectors uh, are, are trying to address deforestation by investing in, in their own supply chain and the landscape. We try to do the same um, since, t um, 2000, since 2015. We have been investing, we've been allocating um, a $12 million um, investment in the landscape outside our supply chain. And uh, the investment we have made for zero deforestation in our own supply chain is, is more than $200 million since 2012. So it's quite, um, quite a, a massive investment, but um, there are several objectives that we are doing with, with our investment. One, which we, we invest to, to reduce the risk of our own investment, commercial, co commercial investment, also business investment, for example, with our own plantation. If we do not invest in the landscape we are operating, our, our investment in plantation will face a lot of risks, risk from encroachment, risk from forest fire, uh, pest and disease and everything else. So our investment in, in landscape is, of course, is, is good for the environment, it's, it's halting the process, but, but at the same time it's also good for business as well. Um, and um, and our second objective is that nobody can, can save the landscape, nobody can, can stop deforestation in the landscape alone. So the second objective of our investment is basically to provide the seed funding, <laughs> or uh, uh, providing the de-risking de elements for other invest investors to come in and co-fund uh, uh, in saving uh, the landscape from uh, forest degradation and deforestation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aida. We will um, shortly come to questions from you, the audience. Um, and um, then towards the very end, I will give the floor to our colleague Renata Rosano, who is our youth representative here at this event, who will summarize. But before we come to questions from you, and please already think about um, what you can contribute to this discussion uh, about Red Plus Policy Learning, I would like to give the floor to uh, the man who is responsible for many of the acronyms I mentioned in the beginning. <laughs> um, because Norway has of course been a champion in moving this entire field forward, both within the UNFCCC and also in fora like the Global Landscapes Forum across the private sector. And Andreas Tveteras is the Deputy Director of the Norwegian Government's climate, International Climate and Forest Initiative, or NICFI, another acronym. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing from Andreas how Norway sees all of these different strands and, f and initiatives they fund and others fund on forests come together in a strategic direction. Andreas, over to you. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tim, and apologies to everyone for, for all the abbreviations. I'll, I'll try not to use them um, in this intervention. I must say that it, it is extremely good to be here and to be able to listen to the presentations from, from two countries with very different backgrounds that, that, that are now sharing experiences and, and from private, private companies that are working towards uh, the same goals of reducing deforestation. This means that the work that many of us started uh, eight years, ten years ago, has now moved from being an idea into a lot of practical activities. And of course Costa Rica has been a uh, front runner, has been doing red long before someone invented that, that abbreviation. Uh, and there is a lot to learn from what you have done in your country. I wanted to mention that I did my master's degree in field work in Costa Rica, so a lot of my reason for sitting here stems from my experiences during that time. The Norwegian Climate and Forest Initiative was launched uh, in 2008, and I, I will be very clear in stating that the primary ob objective of that decision uh, by our government and parliament was climate focused. 
the government saw that reducing deforestation was one of the things that had to be done in order to mitigate climate change. I think the evidence base was strong then, but it has only grown stronger in the years after that. It's also becoming clearer and clearer that in addition to reducing emissions, we are completely depending upon the ability of restoring our ecosystem to capture CO2 from the atmosphere <coughs> if we are going to, to achieve carbon neutrality by the middle of this century. So the focus on landscapes, the focus on forests is still in its early stages and we're still just scratching the surface compared to what needs to be done if, if we are going to use this potential for, for what it's worth and for what we need. And Norway is uh, committed to this in the long run. Our government pledged in Paris one year, one year ago that it will continue the Planet and Forest Initiative until 2030 at least. So we are in this uh, for the long run. We are, as Tim indicated, we are funding a lot of different activities and it might be different to see how they all fit together, but I can assure you they do. But the reason they are plentiful and diverse is linked to a lot of what we have heard through these questions. The, the, the challenge is so complex. We need to mobilize such a wide variety of actors and processes. We need not only to focus on the carbon, we need to focus equally much on social development, uh, economic development, if we are to succeed. One of the key messages or lessons that we learned very early was that the things that we tend to see as drivers of deforestation are recognized as drivers of growth in many countries, and they are. So if we, and recognizing that national governments are the key players, and I, I completely agree, and they, they need to be key. You can't reduce deforestation over time unless governments do what governments are supposed to do, which is to regulate and enforce regulations. <coughs> if governments don't do that, we can achieve results within projects, but not sustainable, sustainable results over time in large areas. So governments are key. The key challenge upon all of us, of course, then, is to be able to answer the question, why should governments bother? Why should governments bother to take up the battle against many strong economic and political forces that in many countries are behind deforestation? We need to be able to demonstrate that, that reducing deforestation will provide, provide the same economic potential, the same number of jobs, and the same welfare for the population. And in that perspective, just paying for reduced carbon emissions is not enough. So we have spent a lot of resources in demonstrating that good land use decisions make economic sense, even without carbon payments. The importance of forest for water supply, for agricultural potential, um, for health in countries where, where forest burning has been a health issue. In some, makes wise land use smart even without carbon payments. Carbon payments is, is a useful addition that's been a lot in uh, Of course, countries like Costa Rica that realized this a long time ago and have tested in a way to ways to, to, to conserve forests um, and, and, and make economic benefits from that are extremely important, <coughs> important now as, as um, places where other countries can learn. So Costa Rica, Brazil, Mexico have an enormously important role in the years ahead as, as learning sites. And we are very happy to work with the UN Red program, for example, to stimulate that that exchange of experience. Of course, the role of the private sector is fundamental. We will not be able to create the same welfare unless, and in new ways, uh, unless we make use of the innovation force of the private sector. So companies that have committed to the New York Declaration are, of course, extremely important actors in this as well. 
But I would like to emphasize that the private sector itself can't solve this. What we need to see are public-private partnerships where governments do what they should do, which is to regulate and enforce in ways that create a playing field wherein the private sector can operate without imposing more deforestation. Some of the companies that have committed to deforestation free supply chains are very openly stating that we can be you guys for a while, but unless governments regulate and make the areas where we stand off and accessible to other companies, there are limits to how long we can see that we are losing uh, areas and markets um, to, to, to companies that do not apply to the same standards as us. So this has to be private sector and government working hand in hand. We are exploring ways in which we could support more uh, innovative approaches in the private sector, for example, uh, <coughs> deforestation-free supply chains and production in landscapes where, where smallholders are, are, are uh, part of the commercial chains. Um, we're exploring the use of, of risk mitigation uh, mechanisms. But we would only do so in landscapes or, or uh, jurisdictions where there is a willingness from the public sector to regulate. That, that, is, uh, that is absolutely critical to make this work. We are, I'm not going to be able to focus on everything we do, but I want to raise one other aspect where we invest a lot, and that is in transparency. Transparency is key. In Norway, we have a set, we, we have this these um, these um, terrible creatures called trolls. They do very bad things, uh, but uh, if they're pulled into the sunlight, they disappear. And I I must say there is a lot of things going on in the woods forests uh, caused by trolls. Uh, now we have to get the uh, sunlight upon them. Uh, so initiatives that improve transparency on what is going on in the world's forests are extremely important. I think we have witnessed some, some, some very positive developments over the last years. For example, the, the Global Forest Watch, which is making close to real-time satellite data of the development of forest cover accessible to everyone everywhere from their mobile phones or computers. That is only the beginning. I think we will see a flourishment of technologies that makes us able to trace products from the source to the supermarket uh, so that companies, consumers, can hold every part of the supply chain uh, accountable. And NGOs uh, can hold their government accountable. Uh, we see an increasing use of these technologies by indigenous peoples groups that are uh, monitoring their ter territories <coughs> using GPS, for example, and, and satellite mapping. So transparency is key. We are also investing significantly in enabling the participation of, of stakeholders, indigenous peoples groups. Social and environmental NGOs have to be part of the discussions on how landscapes and forests are managed on the national level, but also on the global level. And that has also improved rapidly and intensely over the last eight years. So that for those who follow the climate convention negotiations, you will see that the presence of the civil society is much bigger and much more important than it was in the past. And that is also in my belief, one of the reasons why Red has advanced so rapidly <coughs> compared to a lot of other areas on the information. I think I'll stop there for this more discussion. And there's much more to say. Thank you very much, Andreas. And it's certainly exciting times to be working for and with and in the interests of forests and the people who depend on them. Um, thank you to Norway also for that long-term perspective. If you want to understand uh, how Norwegians think, Google a little film called Think Like a Mountain, which is actually quite interesting. 
about a Peruvian exchange student to Norway and how he learned about different ways of seeing the forests. Um, I think we all benefited from that long-term perspective that Norway is taking. And indeed, forests are between 20 and 30 percent of solving the climate crisis, depending on how successful we will be, and 50 percent of solving the biodiversity crisis. So uh, we have to we have to increase our action on forests, and that's now increasingly recognized also over there in the blue zone and in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and elsewhere. So indeed, very exciting times, very many things going on. How we can better link them is the topic of this session, and now we're looking forward to hearing from you, the audience, questions, short comments, if you have any. Um, I would like to ask if you have any questions, briefly introduce yourself, and then <coughs> ask your question if you can in tweet length. And I'll also ask the panel to respond in tweet length if they can. Uh, there are a lot of people here tweeting, and if you manage to stay within that 140 characters, there's a lot of chances that you'll get a much bigger audience than is in this room. And we've seen recently that Twitter can be quite a powerful tool for policy change. Um, so we have um, a few people who, will, um, who might want to start. I will take four questions or five first and then give the floor back to the panel. No ladies to start with. <laughs> Four. Four, so Four so far. All gentlemen. Okay, we'll make an exception then. We'll start over here. Please be very brief and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Bernard Stuhlmid. I'm uh, working for Yara, a private sector company based in, in Norway, but we're also the global leader in the fertilizer industry. Uh, we specialize in providing a knowledge-driven approach to, uh, to serving the markets and working with farmers to help them balance their sustainable land use, uh, the environmental concerns, but also importantly the return on investment uh, for the farmers. So we have the pleasure of uh, operating both in the Ivory Coast market and the Costa Rica market. And I have to say, I'm, I'm very impressed by, by the holistic approach that you're taking to your markets and how you see the uh, agricultural sector as being vital to, to help protect your forest as well. So <clears throat> my, my question goes primarily to Ivory Coast, but uh, probably with some learning from Costa Rica. We know that in Ivory Coast, the uh, cocoa trees are aging. So there's a need to reinvest into replanting cocoa trees to keep up productivity. But there's a financing gap because for the relatively small cocoa farmers uh, to reinvest into their cocoa production, they will be unprofitable for a period of time before their production is uh, restored back to, to high levels again. So I'm just curious to learn how you work with private sector and the cocoa farmers and with investors to support the farmer profitability in this transition phase. Thank you very much. Can we have uh, another question over there? My name is Florian Meiser from Finance in Motion in Frankfurt. We're an impact asset manager and currently raising a sustainable forestry fund with the support of EIB that targets niche markets in Africa and Latin America. Talking from a German perspective, we've seen in Germany that the course of our climate action has often been influenced by lobby groups, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. Uh, I mean, for example, the solar rooftop insulators were very vehement about defending their turf and making sure that it's a continuing effort for probably longer than it should have been. But inversely, the car industry, of course, is known to everybody as being a very strong lobbyist on the other side of things. To Costa Rica and Ivory Coast, very impressed, of course, by the things that you've managed to do. How were lobby groups in your country uh, making a difference? Did you do? Did you have to make concessions? Did you? Did you find ways to to tie them in and, and making them, as 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 has been the case, uh, support the success of your efforts? <coughs> Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Garrity, uh, Senior Fellow of the World Agroforestry Center and Chair of the Evergreen Agriculture Partnership. And I was particularly interested, um, Minister Gutierrez, on your recent uh, engagement in stimulating agroforestry systems as part of the overall forestry program, including civil pastoral, particularly in light of the new data that's just come about 
that indicates that tree cover on agricultural lands across the world is increasing rapidly, and uh, so uh, and, and, and also carbon stocks increasing in agricultural land. And so your comments on how you are proceeding to stimulate agroforestry systems could be another new um, um, a new development in your sharing with other countries on how they could, in fact, follow on to uh, uh, to to ramp up. The, um, the tree cover on agricultural land through agroforestry. So I'd be interested in your comments. Okay, let's have one more in this round. On this side, was there anybody we overlooked over here? Hi, uh, Mark Monsman from the, the Rainforest Alliance. So a question for Mr. Gutierrez. Just on the economics of the PES, the Payment for Ecosystem Services, um, what is how, how much is actually paid to, to the landowners on a how does it work in terms of per hectare and what what would be the percentage of their income uh, over over a year? Great, thank you very much. Let, let's pause there and give the <coughs> panel a chance to answer. The questions were almost all directed to the two country representatives, and that I think is very good because, as we said, the countries are in the driving seat here. It's also encouraging to see that uh, some of the questions came from private sector colleagues. I remember five years ago, if we had an event like this, you would have to drag the private sector um, into the, an event, with the exception of some early movers, but. Um, now I think we have much better participation of private sector colleagues, and again, that's very encouraging. Um, let me start by giving the floor to Costa Rica, Mr. Gutierrez, and then Marcel, and then anybody else from the panel who might want to add. Yes, um, yes thank you. Well, uh, let's uh, start by the lobby, group, lobby groups. Uh, What can I say about that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the way it has been in Costa Rica is that, uh, <coughs> actually, I, I wouldn't say that we don't have a such lobby groups, a such, you know, like uh, constituted lobby groups. We do have, you know, interest groups uh, that, re that relates to the activity. I mean, lobby, a lobbyist is someone that is being paid for doing the job of someone else. You know, it's like, so, in a way, it's, you know, well, I'm not going to say that we have to work with community. We have to learn the, we have to learn the lesson that we have to work with, with, um, with um, um, uh, uh, cooperatives, with uh, uh, corporates, like, uh, for example, the coffee growers. I mean, one important uh, actor in Costa Rica landscape is coffee and, and uh, <laughs> coffee growers are very important, play a very important role in promoting everything and we have learned much about coffee growers, how they do business and how they have improved their own plantations, they have incorporated trees into the plantations and this and that. You know, in Costa Rica, as you know, we have um, uh, shaded coffee plantations and that has helped a lot uh, with, the, with, the, with the capture of, uh, of carbon as well. So it has been it has been an uh, interest of the government, and I would say of any sign, political sign, to incorporate the, the the inputs from from the different sectors within the policy making, and that has been nowadays more strongly supported, and, uh, and uh, it is part already of uh, of a different laws. <coughs> For example, the biodiversity law practically incorporates the stakeholder opinion of the sector and it has been it, it hasn't been easy to negotiate for example with the private sector because then say well we don't want the communities to be saying how much water I have I, I am allowed to use and this and that you know but it has been a struggle but uh, it is going I mean it is it's, it, it, it's, it is going and it is accepted by most of the Congress people but then uh, uh, for that I, I say that uh, as, as, as such lobbyists, uh, we don't have that sort of things, but uh, we do work with different stakeholders. Of course, agroforestry is a very important component. This is crucial. Uh, we've learned, I mean, it's, it, is, it is very interesting because, I mean, allow me just, just a couple more minutes. 
we, we were doing the right things during the 70s and 80s, learning our lessons. And then neoliberals came to our governments. And then they, they destroyed everything. They, they brought the, 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 the short-sighted kind of uh, activities. We wanted to sell everything from the public side in order to, to have more income and more money and this and that, you know, and then uh, everything that comes along with neoliberal. You know. So we lost about uh, 10 to 15 years of mid-term and long-term planning and, and establishing, you know, a common horizon that we developed during the during uh, the previous years. So we are coming back to that. And during that moment, agroforestry was hot in the discussion of our rural agenda. And now it's hot again. Hopefully it's going to stay there. And, it's, and I'm pretty sure it's going to stay because we have learned the, the lesson that we cannot talk about production if we don't talk about conservation. These are two Two, two faces of the same coin. We cannot work on production and increasing productivity of our lands if we do not conserve the major parts of the landscape that has to do with that, uh, that, that with that, uh, with that issue of increasing productivity. So agroforestry is important. We're incorporating more trees in, in, in pasture lands. We're incorporating more trees in, uh, in monocultures, and we're incorporating trees uh, uh, everywhere with that. That we can. And going back to the, your question, P, uh, the, P, uh, the, the PSE, yes, of course, not enough for, for uh, forest management and for forest protection, we pay by hectare, and for agriculture, agriculture uh, agroforestry, we pay by tree. It, uh, the, the many trees you plant, the more money you get. But it's not enough. I mean, what it really represents to a, like, what well, say? 80% 80, 80 of landowners in Costa Rica owns 20 or less hectares. We have, you know, small, small owners, small landowner kind of composition of our landscape. That would be not enough using PSC scheme for a landowner of 20 hectares to have that under reforestation as it sounds nowadays. We are developing a new economic instrument so that we can turn this poor farmer at this moment in time in a degraded land to become a forester or forest em a, a entrepreneur by, by providing the incentives or providing the means so that they can live out of that activity. And that is one of the things that we are trying to develop with the help of some people. You know. but, all right. Thank, thank you very much, Minister. We're unfortunately uh, running short on time. We, we start about five minutes late, so we'll eat five minutes into the coffee break, if you don't mind, because I want to make sure that we all have a chance to wrap up. Uh, let me combine the statements now with a, a quick uh, closing statement from everybody. We'll first give Marcel the floor, very brief, um, and then uh, every one of the panelists, and then Renata will dig out a few nuggets from the entire discussion. Pascal, please. Alors, juste dire que la vieillesse des plantations de cacao en Côte d'Ivoire est la principale cause de déforestation. Parce que les petits agriculteurs, étant donné que leurs plantations sont vieilles, ne produisent plus, vont chercher de nouvelles terres pour faire de nouvelles plantations. Et malheureusement, c'est dans les forêts que ces nouvelles plantations vont se faire. Donc l'idée, le ministère de l'Environnement et celui de l'Agriculture ont réfléchi pour donc renouveler ces plantations de, de cacao qui datent, qui ont pratiquement 30 à 40 ans. Mais fait ces renouvellements de façon progressive. Voilà. Et cette phase de transition-là sera comblée par des incitations financières qui seront données aux, aux paysans, mais également l'agroforesterie en utilisant des essences, euh, des cultures vivrières, pardon pour apporter des revenus alternatifs aux paysans en attendant l'entrée en production des, des nouveaux plants de cacao. Et une nouvelle essence a été testée, mise en, 
en place par les structures de recherche en Côte d'Ivoire avec une production qui intervient au bout de trois ans. Et cette nouvelle licence est compatible avec l'association des arbres forestiers. Et voilà, donc c'est dit que ces, ces renouvellements-là sont pris en compte et vont démarrer déjà à partir de 2017. Merci. Merci, Merci Marcel. Uh, and now let's hear uh, hopefully tweet length or maybe a few tweets, uh, oh. statements from each of the panelists <coughs> to close. Please. Thank you. I, I will connect to the tweet comment because I will pick up on the interest groups. Interest groups are very, very empowered these days. And therefore I want to raise the voice of research and science, being the head of a research organization. And, and so we that do research, we that do science, have a much greater responsibility these days. Not just to do the science with high quality, but also to get it out there. And the Lansky's Forum is an example of this. We want to be, we will be science-based going forward. Secondly, um, I think it is also important for research and science to be humble and realize that all those interest groups, or whoever they are, whichever side they are on, whatever they argue, they actually come up with a lot of questions that need to be answered by research and science and not just by those tweets by interest groups. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I think C4 has been teaching all of us how to connect the science policy and practice gap. And um, that's well noted. Thank you. Aida. Just a few things to make sure that uh, we can support uh, Red Plus in the future. One is we need to remember to embrace the community in our efforts in addressing zero deforestation. Uh, second, we need to leverage the role of private sectors with their wealth of resources, um, human resources and also technology and also fi uh, financial. And third, jurisdictional and landscape approach are key to align strategy among stakeholders and to address leakage. So, those are my comments. Thank you. And uh, last word from Norway before we hand over to Renata. Yes, thank you. I think we have seen from this discussion that, that the work that is being undertaken to achieve Red Plus reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation is done in ways that will contribute to many more sustainable goals than just the ones focused on climate and forest. The work that is being undertaken is empowering populations, it's, it's contributing to economic growth in developing countries. So the impact of our work goes far beyond uh, just the specific. The beauty of RED as a payment mechanism for emission reductions is that it stimulates these social and development, uh, developmental impacts when the emission reductions are produced. But when someone then in, on top of that pays for the emission reductions, that payment is reinvested into activities that can multiply the effect. I think the, the Amazon fund in Brazil is the best existing example, and it's an example that many should look to. Because we are paying Brazil for emission reduction, so we're paying for the climate result. But the money is destined to development activities in the Amazon region of Brazil, creating jobs, creating participation, making uh, indigenous peoples able to, to uh, guard their territories and much more. So I think this is a mechanism that is still a bit poorly understood, but it's of extreme relevance uh, for the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much, Andreas. And now the unenviable task uh, falls to Renata Lozano, who's from the Mexican civil society organization Reforestamos Mexico, where she coordinates the landscape restoration initiative in alliance with World Resource Institute and World Conservation Union. And we have um, not really heard much about the restoration movement and the bond challenge, but all of us, I think, are also engaged in that as one of the initiatives that, in a way, is a spin-off of all this additional activity on forests. Um, Renata is one of the many youth activists who are making the Global Landscapes Home such a special event because we're connecting here also to the youth, the next generation of leaders in our field. And Renata, over to you to the key things that you took from this event to date. Thank you very much, Tim. I will try to be really brief because there are a lot of main key points from, from this session. But first of all, I would say that Cote d'Ivoire and Costa Rica really provide such great lessons. 
And coming from, from a developing country myself, I know that the greatest challenge is always to integrate the ministries of agriculture, mining, environment, and of course forestry into the national planning. So that's really the most important challenge to take over. And of course, all of the progress that you've made, that both countries have made along the way in these past decades, open the path for new restoration initiatives and certainly for zero deforestation initiatives as well. Um, another great point that you mentioned was South-to-South -South cooperation, how we could have more knowledge transfer among developing countries, but also from developed countries as well, in order to really uh, provide the incentives for government and the private sector. Um, as Aida uh, mentioned as well, the private sector is also providing many, many lessons into the table. Um, the, the key point here will be it's not only investing in the supply chains, not only investing in the landscape direct intervention that the company has, but also in a broader view where you could really integrate all indirect actors that are playing a key role in the landscape. And um, transparency, I, I agree, is really the most important challenge when you have all these initiatives playing at the landscape level and you want to sort of provide the government and also the private sector a really very coherent addressing and approach for the landscape in order to have indicators, impact evaluation properly addressed for the government and the investors as well. And uh, for these we also have great instruments such as you mentioned Global Forest Watch and it's really a matter of integrating those in order to achieve our, our success. And I think that that will be all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. That was a very impressive overview, and I think uh, it was a very, very rich learning event. There would, of course, be much more to say. Please take the advantage of the coffee break to speak with the panelists. I would like to give them all a big round of applause before just <laughs> yes, applause for our panelists. And uh, one uh, five second advertisement. If you wonder what all these acronyms are and what they mean, and if you ever wanted to find out what all this Red Plus hype is about, there's something online called the Red Plus Academy, 12 modules, everything from finance to safeguards. It's the most comprehensive free online course on Red Plus or you or any, or any of your colleagues who might be interested. Thank you very much again to all of you, and thanks to the audience for coming and asking interesting questions. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you.